This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here in the Think Tech Studios. And with me today is Nathan Kanoa Sunada. Welcome, Nathan. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Nathan is a PhD candidate in the uh, uh, Daniel Inouye College of Pharmacy at the University of Hawaii over in Hilo and happened to be on the, our island today and, and was able to come in and talk with me here. Thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. And Nathan, uh, earlier, so he's a graduate of Kamehameha Schools yep, uh, and then went off to Miami to get a, a Bachelor of Science uh, and now is back doing his doctorate work, uh, finishing up in, uh, I should say, his, his bachelor's, he was a health, bachelor's in health science, with yeah. minors in mathematics and chemistry. Very impressive. Oh, right. <laughs> AP uh, classes helped a lot with that. And now you, you're, you're in pharmacy, and, and you've, you've sort of taken an interesting path to, to get into your current line of research. Uh, you sort of started out, I guess, in, in sort of wanting to look at native Hawaiian plants and right. use them in a sort of pharmaceutical ways, uh, medicinal ways. But you've, you've taken a rather different shift now. Right. And so, um, so originally coming back from Miami back to Hawaii and specifically to Hilo, um, what drew me to College of Pharmacy was that I could actually explore some of our native plants, right? Um, there's a lot of unique things, a lot of challenges also about going to school and doing research in Hawaii, but one of the unique things is that we can use our Hawaiian plants, right, mm -hmm. as a foundation for sort of this unknown source of um, drugs for drug mm -hmm. sources, for natural products, for lots of things like that. And so my initial um, plan was to study that sort of right. that sort of line of work, right? Um, as a Hawaiian myself, this sort of research to me is very important, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of this translation from tradition to this Western sort of like mainstream being able to use this sort of thing. And so I thought that was kind of a really cool thing to do, sort of perfect for what I wanted to do. Um, but as I kind of came along this thing, it's um, Doing research is more about relationships and about people, such as life, I guess, in general. More than data, more than like getting results, I think um, the essence of life is about relationships. And so, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, that relationship with my mentor didn't work. And in academia, it's very important that you're properly mentored. Absolutely. Right? And so, to me, I didn't get what I needed from that particular um, advisor. And so, um, it kind of came full circle. I came back to my current advisor, who's um, Dr. Donna Lin mm -hmm. Ling who's actually who I wanted to have at first. She's the only Hawaiian um, on staff at uh -huh. the College of Pharmacy. She has a lot of Hawaiian culturally um, outreach and things like that. And so I initially wanted her, but she wasn't able to have me at the time. Uh -huh. And so it kind of came full circle. I came all the way back to her, and now we do cancer biology, uh -huh. Excellent. Um, which is very different than my initial start, uh -huh. but um, in some ways way more rewarding. Yeah, in that sense. Uh, and very interesting what you say about the, the relationships being very important in, right. in science. You, you, you do need to be mentored. You need, you need to have good advisors who can support you and, and who understand yeah. who you are and what you're trying to do just beyond just are you good in the lab? You know? yeah. There is much more to, to, yeah. to a successful career than Absolutely, that. especially like being a minority, like it's, it's um, ideal to have someone to look up to, mm -hmm. right? And being a Hawaiian in like the STEM fields, it's very difficult to find people to look up to, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Pacific to have, Islanders are terrible. To have idols under. or anyone, yeah. even like a success story, like in my personal life, like I don't know of any, right? That have kind of navigated the steps that I have. And so to me, like getting Donna now yeah. is, has been amazing. Yeah. Let's jump in a little bit to, about this research. So you work on sure. this uh, neuroblastoma, so it's, it's, a, it's a cancer of the nervous system, basically. Right, right. And, and furthermore, and, and rather in an ugly way, it's a cancer that only affects, or primarily affects, babies and infants and young children, right? Right, right. Um, so um, actually, could we still, um, slides two? Um, so neuroblastoma is a cancer of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, so neuro refers to nerves. Um, a blastoma refers to a cancer, but specifically a cancer of um, immature, undifferentiated cells. Uh -huh. And so the graph on the right says neuroblast, which is a type of neuro ner nerve cells, uh -huh. right, but young ones. And so eventually the neuroblast must mature into all these different types of nerve cells, like neurons, uh, ganglion, all types of things. And so neuroblastoma occurs in between this transition step. Uh -huh. And so it, that's why it, it occurs only in infants and children, because they're still developing all of their tissues. I see that neurons don't develop properly, the astrocytes right. fall apart, whatever. Right, yeah. right. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so this, this is a very um, difficult to treat disease, um, also very difficult to diagnose because it occurs in infants right. and, who are, and children. Right? Who are not and so, good at telling you what's wrong. <laughs> exactly, <right? laughs> so the main, um, 
I guess you could say the main um, diagnostic factor, right, mm -hmm. is like tiredness mm -hmm. or like a swollen abdomen. And like that's very difficult to, to diagnose in an infant because right. they're asleep all the time, right. right? They cannot vocalize, like you said, right, right. what's wrong. Um, and and that, that just makes it very, very difficult to first find it. And then once you do have it, this is one of the most um, recurrent cancers, um, just in general, of all mm -hmm. cancers. And so about 90% of patients actually die, not from the primary tumor, but from the relapse tumor. Mm -hmm. And so how our, our lab tries to um, treat this disease is, um, instead of, um, I guess, trying to reinvent the wheel, trying mm -hmm. to find all these new sort of um, cancer therapies, we're really, we're trying to understand what neuroblastoma is. Why, and, what goes wrong with yeah, these cells? Yeah. Well, um, understand it better so that we can use, I guess, technologies that we already have. Mm -hmm. And so what we focus on is why does this tumor, is it so, um, why does it relapse so often, right? Okay. Why is it more than half of the patients always have a relapse tumor, a more aggressive, more cancerous, um, drug-resistant tumor, right? It's very similar to antibiotics where after a while, antibiotics just don't work right. because you develop resistance. So cancer is the exact same way only you're using much more lethal um, forms of therapy, right. right? And so the resistance that it accumulates is very drastic, right. and very sudden, right? Right. So, And of course, infants are developing the nervous systems very rapidly. Yeah, and exactly, they're, they're and the nervous system is, is right. everywhere. Yeah, it's right. everywhere, it, it innervates literally and, everything in the body. And does this have a, uh, occur typically in one spot or another in the nervous system? Yeah, or so, can it manifest so, in different ways? So it occurs most commonly in the adrenal gland and the nervous tissue above the adrenal gland, but again, like, this cancer metastasizes very quickly. So that, what that means is the cancer starts in the abdomen, mm -hmm. but it can travel into the bloodstream anywhere, right. into the bone marrow, into the liver, into the brain, anywhere. And that's really what, um, what really har harms the patients, right? Because it's, it's easy to treat it when it's a tumor. Mm -hmm. When it's everywhere, it's, it's, it's very impossible to eradicate it completely. Right. And so again, all the more reason you want to catch it early, so you want right. to have a good diagnostic tool, so right. you want exactly. patients to be able to tell you about exactly. anything that's exactly. wrong, which infants can't do. And exactly, right. exactly. So very, you very aren't difficult. picking it up too late in its course, anyhow. Right, right. right. And so, this, this, so these, all these factors kind of makes it this difficult disease to treat. Right. And so what we look at is how does it become this normal, this original neuroblastoma tumor, and become this drug-resistant tumor. Okay. And we look at lots of different um, cellular signaling pathways, right? Okay. Um, specifically, we look at calcium, um, which is a sort of fundamental um, signaling molecule in every, every single cell in the body, regardless if it's muscle, skin, your eyes, anything really mobilizes calcium for anything, for regulation of um, its life. So it can also kill itself based on its calcium, all these sort of things. So if you try to understand cancer in general, right, cancer is a dysregulation of all these, all these factors, right? right? For one, the main one is growth, right? right. That's what cancer is, right? right? Grows uncontrollably. Right. But also, all of its biology is sort of um, very, very aberrant. Right, right. right. I mean, most cancer up. cells are yeah. very, have every abnormal appearance. Almost, <laughs> yeah. exactly, exactly. And so calcium is just one of those pathways right. that's... But it's a very important one. But, yeah. but because right. it's so fundamental, that's kind of what we're choosing to look at. Okay. So maybe go to that next year, next year, slide three there? Yeah, yeah, sure. So this is a schematic that I've made just, just this is any cell in the body. So mm -hmm. every cell contains calcium in it and your cell stores calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum which is that kind of squ squirrely thing with mm -hmm. the dots in it. And it stores it in here so that when it needs it, it can release it. And then that's kind of what triggers all these different effects. So, so um, essentially what we look at is all, everything colored in here, we measure all these mm -hmm. pumps and types channels, of, types of receptors, all these they receptors are, yeah, right. right? All these things, there's a whole global calcium signaling pathway. Right. And so our goal in their lab is to figure out what is altered as the neuroblastoma develops drug resistance. Okay. And once we have targeted these things that contribute to drug resistance, can we then knock them down and revert it back to this original state where we can then treat it again right. with a normal sort of chemotherapeutics that okay. work, work very, very well. And you've got some dynamic little uh, videos here, I think. That, that, yeah, that so, so um, the way that we measure calcium is we stain cells. We, mm -hmm. So these are live cells. So this is just examples of different organelles in the cell, right. which are different compartments. Right. So this is the lysosomes, which are just storage compartments. Right. They're stained red, the calcium right. is green. Um, this is the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Um, when we apply a certain stimulus, you can see them sort of burst, right. right? And so that correlates with calcium releasing specifically at the ER level. Okay. Um, this next one is the mitochondria, which are red, right? Again, right. They'll, they'll flash 
right. through. And so really calcium signaling is very global in the cell. It okay. affects essentially everything. Right, things are trading, sort of trading right, calcium. Right, there's a lot of crosstalk between right. all these sorts of things. And this last one is just the nucleus. Again, um, there's a lot, lot going on. Yeah, yeah. Right. So this course runs. There's a, lot to un, there's a lot to unpack. Sure, sure. Um, in the signaling pathway. But the way that we sort of extrapolate data from this is we take these figures, right, these, um, these live cell images mm -hmm. that we've stained with color, and we can extrapolate um, graphs from it in real time. Okay. And so we can say that, oh, as we apply a certain stimulus to the cell, it will um, release calcium in this sort of um, linear sort of way, and it will kind of fade out. And this depends on the cell type. Okay. Right? And as the cell develops from um, regular to drug resistant, right, that's, this signaling kind of changes. Um, okay. So can we see figure, um, or the video four? So these are the figures that I'm talking about, okay. right? So black and white would be differences between normal and drug resistant, okay. right? And this kind of pairs with the graphic on the right. Mm -hmm. And so it, from the top graph, it's very obvious that there's a big difference in the right-hand side, right? There's a huge right. jump. Right. Um, the bottom graph is not so easy to see. Right, but But this is the kind of data that we kind of extrapolate to get okay. and see, that, all right, there are definitely differences. Yeah. So if we could negate those differences, can we then treat them right. normally again? And you would negate them by going back and either blocking receptors yeah. or opening them up yeah. or something, yeah. right? Right, so a cool thing about calcium signaling is it's very well understood. Mm -hmm. It's fundamental to all cells, so it's very, very well understood. And so there's lots of um, tools that we can use to like inhibit, block mm -hmm. certain things. There's a lot of ways that we can manipulate, but our key really is, is identifying, yeah? uh -huh. is finding um, what, what should we target? Like, what can we do to kind of um, help in this thing? And, and that's kind of the challenge, but also like the, the exciting part in it. Sure, and it's a, it's a very interesting uh, point you're, you're trying to move in. It's not looking at what makes a normal cell become cancerous, but it's right. what makes it the, sort of the first stage of the cancerous cells become right. really nasty. Right, right, yeah. right. because um, neuroblastoma is classified right. by risk, right? There's low risk mm -hmm. and high risk. And 60% of the cases are high risk. Right. And the high risk, are, there's almost no survival from them, right. right? I think the general survival rate for neuroblastomas in general is like 60 something percent, right? Yes. It's one of the lowest out of all childhood yeah. cancers. Um, and so drug resistance is a huge part of that, right? right? Because right. you can treat them very well initially. Right. But when, when it comes back, they're just, they're intolerable to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's throwing tantrums and everything, right, yeah. in the body. It's, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, fascinating to, to see this. And of course, huge applications for this. Uh, once you learn that, uh, these mechanisms that probably will inform other people working on right. other forms of cancer too, which right. also go through that same transition Absolutely. being Absolutely. reasonably amenable to treatment early on, right. and then at some point they change and become truly yep. metastatic and uh, want to go all over the body and behave in a much more aggressive fashion. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So I think the biggest finding that we found so far is that they just, um, they tolerate their calcium internally differently, right? So I said that they store calcium, every cell stores calcium in the ER, right? But the drug resistant cells, um, it's like they, they can tolerate more calcium in their um, cytoplasm, and so they don't store as much. And so when they do release it, they release less. And so they just, they um, turn things on differently, turn the proteins on, turn everything on just a little bit differently, mm -hmm. right? Which has this cascade of all these different um, downstream effects and, and all these things and so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it so sounds like very exciting work. Um, I, I think uh, you've, got, you've got your work cut out. For yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say <laughs> job so. Job security, but. job security. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, looks, that looks great. I, um, uh, but there's a whole other part to <coughs> sorry, your work that is you, you've really gotten where you are uh, as you commented briefly early on, there are not many Hawaiian, yeah. uh, Native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders in, stunt, in science and STEM. It's, it's right. not a something, and there's a whole sort of, there are many cultural aspects why this is so and all. Absolutely. And when we come back, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but right now uh, we need to take about a one minute break uh, Nathan Sonata is here with me. I'm Ethan Allen, your host of Likeable Science, and we'll be back in one minute. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. 
Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Welcome back here to Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today is Nathan Sonata from the University of Hawaii at Hilo. He's finishing up his doctorate in the School of Pharmacy there. Yep. Uh, we were talking in the first part of the show about the cancer research that you do, very exciting stuff on neuroblastoma, uh, a rather nasty uh, yeah. childhood cancer, Some all the complexities that you just uh, gave us a very nice summary of, of why it's so hard to, to work with, what strides you're making. But there's, there's been, beyond sort of the, the, sort of the academic cognitive challenges of, of working in, in this area, you, you face some other challenges, right? We, we commented earlier uh, we were, when we were talking, you, you pointed out you're, you graduated from Kamehameha School in a, in a class of 450 people, I think you said. Yeah. And you think there's a handful of those gone into graduate school. Um, yeah, as, as, far as, um, as far as I can tell, um, very few of my classmates pursued graduate school. Mm -hmm. and. And, and of course, even less pursued PhDs. I know of one. I know of um, a few in med school, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know of one PhD who um, who's in mathematics, I okay. believe. But there's there's a lack of of I guess research based sort of um, pathways that are being taken, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. I mean, I think there's a, quite a lot of factors, honestly. Yeah, uh, I mean, certainly I know Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are. Sort of grossly underrepresented in the whole STEM field, STEM education, at every step you look, right. you look at all the higher levels. Uh, I mean, even bachelor's and master's and doctorate, the, the percentages keep dropping and dropping. And some of this, uh, I, as we were talking before the show a little bit, may have to do with sort of a whole cultural approach, right? Yeah, I definitely, definitely. There's a lot of cultural um, into that. I mean, especially just. Just in Hawaii, I mean, there's just that landlocked element, right? Mm -hmm. There's that. Um, there's the family element, right? Mm -hmm. There's the your family depends on you for lots of things, and so you can't leave in some senses, right? There's also the the other aspect where you don't want to leave because this is so comfortable to right. you, right? Um, there's also a part where it's not really pushed, where like, um, well, well, like I said earlier, we just don't have a lot of people to look up to, right? Right. We don't yeah. have a lot of people there to role just, models, right? To say like, oh, this is exactly how you can obtain. Um, this type of degree and this is exactly what's going to happen and so without that I mean I think you have to use your imagination and if you if, if that you're not comfortable doing that then I think it's very difficult right so that's why I'm so lucky that I have someone like Donna Koumoa who has done exactly what I did and she's a woman right so right. she's a Hawaiian woman right. in like you know in in right. hard stem science and so that to me is very very inspiring right and she's given me lots of great mentorship but I think in general, just for, for the kids, I think, you know, like, science should be pushed a little bit further, maybe. Right, right. Uh, but in, in part of it is, as you say, peculiar to the islands, right? We don't have a, a thriving pharmaceutical or, right. or biotech industries really here very much in Hawaii. We're getting a little bit now, yeah. but it's, it's been very slow coming. So there haven't been that many opportunities for anyone, much less Native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders, to be in those yeah. positions, be, be STEM leaders, be STEM role models. As for the, the universities have been pretty slow on picking up uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders into the faculty positions. Right, they're, right. They're underrepresented there. And, and to be successful in this type of field, I think you kind of have to go away. Mm -hmm. And then if your plan is to come back, you have to come back only after the fact. Yeah. Right? You have to gain some experience. You have to, like you said, there's just not that much opportunity here for at least at least research based sort of um, right sort of programs and there, there are wonderful efforts now to counteract that trend uh, oh, yeah. I, I work I do some external evaluation for the uh, EPSCOR National Science Foundation EPSCOR project IKIVAI dealing with Hawaii's groundwater and then yeah, one of cool. their explicitly one of their goals is to get more native Hawaiian students involved in doing this fundamental water research and that has enough or interesting and sort of culturally appropriate yeah, pull, yeah. The right? Water, yeah, the water has been very central to, to Hawaii, and uh -huh. so sort of studying the water is makes some sense to a lot more students, and it's, it's actually right. interesting to see right. this. So culture. I think that's a good point you made, though, where it's about interest, right? right? And how do you generate interest in, tro in the children, right? Because, I mean, at least when I was growing up, like, it wasn't cool to be a nerd, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't cool to, like, like science and, like, math like I did. Like, I like, like, 
picking rocks and like looking for bugs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know, and I love science and I love that sort of thing. And it, and it's not, um, it's not as accept. I think it's more accepted now, right? Mm -hmm. This generation is so much more up with technology, right? With right. being able to do all these different sorts of things that like my generation didn't have. Right. But again, like how do you sort of channel that into into careers, right? Not just like, oh, I'm good with my phone, I'm good with social media, I'm good with my computer. How do you channel that into, oh, I'm good with tech, I'm good with coding, I'm good right. with like doing some sort of like real science. Right? So I think that's become the issue, right? Where like everything's at the tip of everyone's fingertips now. Right. right? But it's it's integrating that into like a, a way that's like motivating, I guess, for for the younger generations. Yeah, I mean, as you say, it sort of does open up some doors and windows. I mean, for instance, this program that we're producing now will allow, will allow you to sort of be a, 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 an image or role model, at least right. on some superficial level, to right. a gazillion people, right? <laughs> uh, and that wasn't around 10 years ago, 20 years ago at all. Uh, so these, these channels have opened up, but still, yeah. even, if they're, even if children grow up and see sort of on video or whatever some role models, when they get an actual university, right. they're, they're still going to find right. They're still going to be they're still going to be minorities, right? Yes, right? They're still going to not have as much support as right. as the rest. But I think um, to your other point, I think isolation too is a big factor. Right. Just being in Hawaii in general, right. which I mean, is very isolated from everything else. It's broken right. up into a you know, smaller islands that are separated from each other. I mean, yeah. Communication is hard. There's a lot of travel involved, which is expensive and difficult. Right. Right. So just from like what I've seen on the research side, like it's it's difficult to be out here by ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when we have the pharmacy school in Hilo and we have the medical school and the rest of the facilities in on Oahu. It's very difficult to sort of collaborate and share. And also when we collaborate with other PIs, like for example on the mainland, mm -hmm. right? When we have to exchange information back and forth, that gets hard just by the hourly. But that can you can work through that. But when you have to ship um, goods, like we sometimes we ship cancer cells, sometimes mm -hmm. we ship drugs, treatments, like. That has to go overseas and has to be on ice, right? right. Has to be all these sort of things to right. make sure that it, it lands okay, and and so that creates its own set of challenges too. Yeah, there, there are, you know, again, we have technologies now that are overcoming, and I've been uh, interested to see this the so-called cyber canoe that they now have right. that, that connects uh, yeah. Kilo yeah. and Manoa here campuses very yeah, very neatly with these yeah, big, huge cool. multi-screen events, so you can really get people right. essentially almost in the same room, even if they're separated. You know, right. and as that continues to grow and develop, presumably that's going to help address some of these issues. Yeah, absolutely. That's what, like, we're going in the right direction. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of time where, I mean, I mean, I think as a whole, kids are more excited about science than they, than they used to be, mm -hmm. I think just as, as a general rule of thumb. But again, it's not where it needs to be, especially like in specifically like the Hawaiian community. Like it's, it's, it's just not that, um, again, there's no role models. Right, right. And so like they would rather, I think, Better role models in the Hawaiian community are, are other types of leaders, not necessarily like academic leaders, mm -hmm. right? I think they look to lots of other figures for leadership. Yeah. Right? When, if we had a good, you know, representative of, of our field, I think that would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. But again, like being a Hawaiian and being a minority is not strictly negative. I right, think right, I, right. I think it depends a lot on how you look at it, right? So so tell us some of the, the benefits so, and advantages. Um, so well, very easily the biggest benefit is scholarships, right? Uh -huh. Being a being a Hawaiian has afforded me so much opportunity just, just by being Hawaiian, right? Uh -huh. Just by going to Kamehameha schools and having some of this culture, like it, it's it's very beneficial, right? Okay. And it makes me very attractive as an applicant, okay. right? So as I, especially like, since I'm applying for research grants and all this sort of thing, like incorporating um, minorities into your grants and stuff is is very powerful, uh -huh. and so I'm able to get funding like based on I guess just my ethnicity. Right? Mm -hmm. Just in that sort of thing, and so if you if you look at it from that perspective, then being a minority is really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, it's really unique, and like it's really what's in some ways it's what it's the first thing that separates me, and then it's my merit, mm -hmm. right? Because on a sheet of paper, I mean, everyone looks the same except that sort of thing, and and so yeah, I've I've never really viewed it as that much of a crutch. It's just mm -hmm. more of an, it's just like another barrier you have to pass through. Right, right. It's like. If I was gonna quit, I would have quit a long time ago. Right? Right. <laughs> like, sure. like just just being that is is not is not really enough of a factor. Mm -hmm. I think. I mean, I think you can spin anything to be positive as long as you want to. Right. Right. Yeah. It's it's large. Your attitude is is gonna determine. Yeah, again, this sort of gets us back to the earlier discussion about why you need good mentoring, good support from an advisor, right. because that that helps right. sort of put the whole attitude around you and and, and the attitude of the lab that you're in is very important. Yeah, I always, I always knew that fact, but I think 
being in this program has really solidified that for me mm -hmm. because it's I've always thought that like I could I've been very independent my whole life right mm -hmm. like I can always do things by myself I could always figure it out but there was a point in this program where I couldn't mm -hmm. right and that was very humbling for me oh. right because there's there's a point where like I'm I need help, right? right. And, and I'm not very good at accepting help or asking for help, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think a lot of people aren't, are like that. Um, and, and so that was very humbling for me. And, and once I kind of opened, opened it up, it's like this sort of relationship kind of evolved through it. And it's, it's been nothing but, but amazing. Yeah, well, science, particularly now, is becoming increasingly collaborative. And as right. is, you got it very clear to you in this cancer research, you've got to have all kinds of different people from oh, clinicians yeah. to basic bench scientists and everyone sort of in between. And, electronics wizards and chemi yeah. chemists working with you and all these different kinds of groups right. helping out and putting their expertise together in a coordinated fashion to make this all work. Yeah, so. absolutely. It's, it's very easy in our field, right? We look at one cell. <laughs> we look at one ion in the cell, right, calcium. And so it's very easy for us to get tunnel vision and kind of forget about, about the big picture. Sure, the, the, the old saying is <clears throat> that's what graduate school teaches you to look you know, more and more <laughs> about less and less until you know everything there is to know about nothing at all. <laughs> nothing, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh, we, we, the, the programs are trying to get around that now. They are actually making efforts to, to broaden out and help maintain a Right, but that's why it's always good to, like, I've, I've gone to many conferences. Um, being in SHARP, um, Students of Hawaii Advanced Research Program, mm -hmm. um, has afforded me a lot of opportunity to, like, go to conferences mm -hmm. once a year. And so at these conferences, I've interacted with lots of different types of, um, I guess, health professionals, mm -hmm. right? So not only researchers like me, but like medical doctors cool. and like nurses cool. and like parents of patients. Mm -hmm. So like you kind of get this this total like perspective, right, on everything. And that's very important when you're, because th the bottom line is about patients, right? Right. The bottom line is understanding this disease, not like publishing papers or like getting recognition, exactly. right? The point is the patients, right? And without understanding like all of the, the factors, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And yeah. you're only doing no, like, you're, you're doing yeah. it. You got your your yeah, you're not slice of that, but you know it's it's a big pie. Right, right. Because there's no point in finding a novel drug when you have to apply like, like this much. <laughs> you know, you have to give the patient like a lethal dose. Right. For it. Like there's no right. There's no right. point. You have to look at it from the from the from perspective, perspective of the patient. And, and absolutely. Hey, well, this has been fascinating. Uh, but we have, we have come to the end of our uh, time here. Uh, Nathan Sonata, PhD candidate at uh, University of Hawaii in Hilo, uh, the Pharm School of Pharmacy there. And I'm, uh, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thank I you really so appreciate much. It. Appreciate it. And I hope you'll come back and join us on another episode of The Likeable Science next week.